This is the trial of Sarah Boone out of Orange County, Florida. This is the suitcase killer. We will be streaming this trial daily on this channel at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until it concludes. So hopefully you guys will all be here. We will also post highlight videos and witness testimony nightly after the trial commences. So make sure you stay tuned for that and subscribe if you haven't. See you there. Welcome all you couch detectives out there. Join us every week for new cases, and if you're a fan of true crime, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything. The absolute best way to support the channel is to subscribe, and if you appreciate what we're doing here, hit that like button, let us know that we're moving in the right direction. Okay, enough rambling, let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I appreciate y'all being here. I was introduced before. My name is James Owens, and I represent Sarah Boone, along with Tom Henderson and Kevin Bell. Now, this is going to be a seven-day trial. Obviously, it's day. We're not sure, but we're trying to make um, arrangements for witnesses to find you. Expert witnesses and whatnot, and we'll know more probably at the end of the day when we need money so we can complain. But I know your focus is on this case because you took the note to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no higher call than to write a woman. No higher call than to write a woman. And we're going to ask you to make the case to write this woman. We find Sarah Boone not guilty because she was justified in the force that she used to defend herself. If that force was reasonable under the circumstances that existed between Sarah Boone and George Torres. Sarah Boone and George Torres were down and out as you can be. Their life centered around alcohol. Both of them suffered from, used to be called alcoholism, now it's called alcohol abuse syndrome. And so day to day, they struggled with the use of alcohol. You can imagine that. It affected their jobs. It affected keeping employment. It affected even getting a job. As codependent as you can be towards each other. And you're going to learn with all that was domestic violence. And that George Torres physically abused Sarah Boone. And she suffered from the effects, the psychological effects that one suffers from repeat <coughs> violence from an intimate partner. They were together over three years, and there were several prior incidences of violence. We've got the photographs. There were incidences where police were called who took photographs. So you're going to be able to see the evidence and believe, we believe the court will instruct you at the end when you're considering self-defense, which we call justifiable use of non-deadly force or justifiable use of deadly force, that you can consider the prior acts, the history of violence, the prior difficulties that the parties had, and considering her set of circumstances that she was faced with 
in making the decision to use reasonable force under the circumstances. And the most important thing I can tell you here today is keep an open mind. There's two sides to every story. You're going to hear the state's side in attempting to paint her a certain way, as they've done here today in opening statement. And then you're going to hear another side. And you're going to have to weigh that. All the evidence, the credibility of the witnesses, the photographs, the videotapes, and come to a conclusion. Now let's talk about this day, February 23rd of 2020, the date of this event. This, this case has been pending for some time. Here we are, October of 2024. I think the evidence is going to show that they had purchased some wine the day before, but they hadn't finished all of that. So it was in the refrigerator. Many times that's how they start their day. At some point, you're going to see a video from Publix, from where they live. I believe it's Winter Park. But Publix was not too far from their apartment complex. And they took their car, they drove over there. So you're going to see a videotape from Publix of them both going in the store about noon. And they come out with one of those larger bottles of the wine. And then, of course, uh, there's a receipt. And the bottles are in the garbage can. Of course, there obviously is an attraction between the two. And as everybody knows, um, couples can have great times where things click, everybody gets along, and then we can have episodes of disagreement. And how are those resolved? Really, is what this is about. How are disagreements resolved? But George was very jealous of Sarah. And you're going to hear the testimony about that and that he cannot, in certain situations, he can be very charming. But when his level of intoxication gets to a certain level, is when he gets sad, moody, and a lot of times, eventually, it involves forcible sex with Sarah Boone or actual physical violence against her. They bought the wine. It's a simple life. They don't have much money. Uh, but they both like art. They did that for a while. They both like puzzles. They did that for a while. Well, about five or so, the wine bottle was gone. And George had said, I want to go get some cigarettes. So there's a convenience store right close by their apartment complex. And, and Sarah thought he was just going to walk over there and get cigarettes and come back. But no, what he did was he, he got her keys, he got her debit card, and he went over to the Publix and he got another bar. And I think that was about five, five days, something like that. And again, there'll be the Publix video showing him going in and going out, and there'll be a receipt for the purchase of that bottle, and then they'll keep that bottle. Uh, we'll be in the garbage can along with the other bottle. Well, when he comes in with the second bottle, Sarah, Sarah knows this is not good. She knows this means he's going to get to another level of intoxication. So Sarah's concerned. So she <coughs> attempts to placate him, keep him busy, keep him in a good mood. They drink that bottle, or she drinks as well. And at some point, they're intoxicated at a high level. As some people do when they're drunk, they get silly. And they, the 
decide to play a game of hide and seek. She goes upstairs, their bedroom's upstairs, to the shower and waits for a period of time. And he doesn't come to her. At some point, she gets cold, she gets tired. She wants to go see, well, maybe, maybe we've got it mixed up. Where is he? So she goes downstairs, and they had gotten a suitcase down a week or so ago. It's an old suitcase uh, that they were going to donate to Helping Hands or Goodwill or somebody, and they were putting some items in there. And it's a broken down suitcase. It's a large suitcase. They both weigh about 100 pounds. Uh, and they don't eat good. Mal malnourished to a large degree. Um, but the pull handle is broken off. And they've attached a little uh, paper clip that's got the rubber around it. And that's how they move it back and forth. Well, she comes down the steps, she sees him getting in and settling in the suitcase. So she walks over there and, you know, they see each other, they smile and laugh, and she, she zips him up. And she zips him up and they laugh for a while. And they carry on, she sits on the couch, and at some point he says, I can't breathe. Now, his face is facing the zipper, and she's got, she's got two or three inches that she's opened it. And she doesn't know. They're intoxicated. She doesn't know whether he's just saying that to try to get her to get him out or what. But he's a captive audience. Physically, they're the same size, but he, he's much stronger than her. If they got in a fist fight, he would win a hundred times out of a hundred. But she's got him now. He claims he can't get up. He has to sit and listen. It's a unique form of physical restraint. And so she lets him have it. Says things she shouldn't say. You'll see the video. It's about two minutes long. She videotapes it. She sits on the couch and turns her phone on and videotapes it for about two minutes. There's another video that's approximately 11 minutes later. The first video, George is... The, the suitcase is flipped upside down. The zippers on the bottom. Eleven minutes later, Sarah has flipped it right side up. Again, open for him to get out. And it's only 22 seconds. And you hear George say, Sarah. And that's it. Now the key to the case is that 11 minutes. And what happened during that 11 minutes? Okay? That is the key to this case. Sarah Boone will take the stand. She will explain what happened. She will explain why it happened. The evidence will show that she was justified in the action she took to prevent an attack from George Forrest, which the law acknowledges that every one of us has a right to invoke, the right of self-defense. You can hear from the medical examiner. She is going to tell you about some bruising on George Torres. Of course,
course, he was in the suitcase a while, deceased, we believe. And that changes things a little bit, as the medical examiner will explain. But there's some bruising. Sarah's going to explain that to you. Why that happened? What were the circumstances surrounding that? Involving that. Her son comes and stays with them from time to time. He has his own room. He has several of his things there. And there's a bat downstairs. The same bat that George Torres used, and there's a video where George is threatening Sarah. And he's swinging the bat at the TV about as hard as he can. And he does it about six or seven times. You'll see it. Sarah's recording it. And it's during an argument. And he's trying to intimidate her. Sarah loved you. You know, you're going to hear why. Why women don't leave? Why women don't leave? And you're going to hear about Sarah Boone and her struggles, her mental health struggles. Sarah had no intent to kill him. The prosecutor mentioned she wanted him to die. Farthest from the truth, she loved the man. She hated the abuse. She couldn't leave him. She tried. She tried kicking him out six or seven times. He kept coming back. She changed the locks. He kept coming back. She didn't have the family. She didn't have the support. She was weak. Vulnerable. You're going to hear it all. You've got to take that all into account to try to understand what happened and the circumstances surrounding this tumultuous relationship. Now, you're going to find that Sarah's not perfect. And, you know, she goes, as many of us do when we drink too much, you, know, you sleep in. She slept in. 11, 12, 1, somewhere around there. She moses downstairs looking for George. Thought he was on the computer looking for a job. She looked outside, maybe he's out smoking a cigarette, and she sees the suitcase. She unzips it. She gets him out. He's purple. She tries her best to do some CPR. She freaks out. She, she, the, only, the only family she's got is her ex-husband, really. She relies on him. As the prosecutor said, a lot of times she'll flee to her ex-husband's house. Where her son is at. Lucas. It's the only thing she knows to do. She's kind of a, she's kind of a sheltered daughter when she was younger. She's smart, but she's, she's not worldly. She calls Brian. What do I do? He said, I'm coming over. Please, please come over. He's, he's about five minutes away. And she calls him again within a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the way. He gets there. He walks in the foyer and sees his legs. He said, call 911. She calls 911 within a minute or two. 
Uh, Detective Rodriguez arrives. You know, they got the body cam now, so it's it's recorded. So you're going to hear Sarah talking. But Sarah's freaking out. Sarah's thinking, and I'm, I'm, I'm somehow responsible. Eventually, she gives a statement to law enforcement. She gives one to Detective or Debbie Rodriguez. Of course, she's not the homicide investigator. She just responded. She's the first responder. And you know they know what to do. They try to assess the situation. They start putting the tape out, and then they call for the homicide investigators to come, which takes a little time. Um, so she gets a statement from Sarah. Eventually, the homicide detectives get a statement from Sarah, and the one of the unmarked squad cars, and it's recorded. They hear that, and then the next day, they they take Sarah's phone. Sarah gives them the phone, signs the consent, take the phone, take it to. Uh, they have a phone phone extraction people at the sheriff's department where they can take it, and take out all the data, all your phone calls, text messages, photographs, videos, all that. And they find these two videos. Sarah is not aware, she doesn't remember making the video. You can imagine. She gives them the phone. Or well, she makes no attempts to do anything other than here's the phone. So they tell her, you, you, you're going to get your phone back tomorrow. We'll bring it back to you tomorrow. Well, they end up having a conversation with the female detective, homicide detective. Copson is her name. Chelsea Copson. And they end up, Deputy Copson was pregnant, or Detective Copson was pregnant. So they end up, hey, um, we're not going to bring your phone. I'm not feeling good, I'm pregnant. Can you, can you come to the sheriff's party? Which Sarah Ben was telling me that that was what I was going. That's what they told me I was going to the sheriff's party for. Well, instead, it was an interrogation. <laughs> And they were going to arrest her. They made their mind up on it. And they were going to confront her and try to get her to confess based on the two videos. And so there's approximately a two hour interrogation that was on the 25th in the afternoon when she got there to get her phone. They said, Well, we got to come up here. We need to talk to you. And they got her in the room. It's a small room, but it's being videotaped and audio taped. And it goes on for about two hours of them trying to get a confession to murder. And it doesn't happen. But Sarah lies. She's scared. She can tell they're trying to pin her on this, that this was some kind of intentional act. And it was not. So she lies. She's not a lawyer. She doesn't know about self-defense. She doesn't understand she has a lawful right to defend herself. She doesn't understand that she's justified in using the force that she used. She doesn't... I wasn't there to advise her. No lawyer was there. So she lied. And you're going to hear that. So you're going to have to balance that versus her taking the stand and testifying before you. And we simply ask that you look for the evidence of cooperation of her testimony. It's going to be later, probably next week. The judges will tell you and read an instruction on evaluating a witness's credibility. And they'll talk about cooperative evidence, other evidence that's consistent with the testimony that Sarah Brown would give you. So you're going to have to weigh that in her testimony. Now, self defense, you know, we talked about it in jury selection, usually a gun, some deadly weapon. The suitcase in this case was a physical restraint or a blocking of an attack. 
but it was unconventional. Self-defense, nonetheless. Now, as I said, the struggles that occurred, many of them involved the police. So you're going to actually hear from some of the police officers. Maybe some body cam footage. You're going to see some photographs that they took of the injuries to Sarah Boone. And some of the videos you may see of her in a very happy, joyful type of thing. Well, number one, she's intoxicated. Number two, she's safe. The police are there. So her attitude is not a one of distress. You know, we're here, we're here today, full packed courtroom. The trainers here, but but you're the most important people. Because you've got to decide this case honestly, fairly, and according to the law. And we talked about the two biggest principles from the Constitution that apply. In this case, and in every case in which a citizen like Sarah Boone is brought into a courtroom and accused of a crime, the first is you as a juror must presume or believe that Sarah is innocent. And that belief stays with you throughout the entire trial. Because of that, she doesn't have to prove anything. That's why the state went first in jury selection. That's why the state went first today. That's why the state will go first putting on their case. They have the burden of proof, and it's the highest burden we recognize in any type of litigation in this country. Proof beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. You are going to have doubts about this case. But the most important thing is not to rush to judge it, to keep an open mind and understand there's two sides to this case. There's their side and there's our side. So you can't form any fixed opinions early on. That's hard to do, as Mr. Henderson said in opening or in jury selection. That's extremely hard to do. Now you're going to hear some testimony that's been mentioned by experts. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Victims of repeat violence may fear death in a situation others would not. After hearing both sides of this case, we're confident you're going to have a reasonable doubt. And we're going to ask you to follow the law and do justice in this case. And find Sarah Boone not guilty because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can the parties approach for a moment? The next video in this series should be here, and they were all linked in the description. And we do stream this trial while it's going on at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every single morning. See you guys there.